AJ. Hello. Hello, everybody. Let's we have Jim Drew's demonstration of neato stuff. Okay, Jim, go. Go. All right, everyone who's going to watch this, come gather around. I've got the circular presentation here, basically. I need a wheelchair. <laughs> wheelchair. I like that shirt. Oh, thank you. Cool. All right, I'm sure pretty much now everybody knows who I am. Jim Drew, CBOStuff.com. A long time 64 developer and Amiga developer. I can't even tell you how many years. Started in 78 programming on PET 2001, chiclet keyboard, and then still doing it today. Still have the same pets, in fact. Anyways, um, so basically people know me for making copy programs back in the day. I made Supercar Pro a few years ago, which was a little board that lets you use a PC floppy drive to duplicate. Oh, this. Thank you, AJ. Thank so. you, Vanna. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. Huh? laughs> Let's duplicate uh, basically everything on the planet. It's a flux copier. Um, so it's the modern version of my old stuff. And so I still have that product. And um, I wanted to make some new stuff for a 64. Um, so it was kind of a toss up. I was working on a product called uh, MicroDrive, which is a real 1541 emulator. And that's it right there, actually. It's actually a pre production unit. And I was kind of tossed between that and my Y modem, which is a modem for internet connection for BBSing. I needed the Wi-Fi support for another contract I'm doing, so it won the battle. So I don't have this quite finished yet. Um, I've got SD card support I have to finish, and this will be done as well. So this will give you a true 1541 emulation, or a true 1571 emulation, or a true 1581 emulation. And if I win the hard drive over there in the raft, it'll give you a hard drive emulation too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little hint. So the, the Y modem is a, it's a little board that plugs into your user port on any of your Commodore products. Um, it's got a little OLED display. There's a, a guy who likes to do 3D printing and make cases, so he actually made a little case for it. The display is a multicolored display, which is kind of nice, but it gives you status information about what's going on. Jim, didn't you donate one of those as a major raffle There's three donated. So you guys have three different chances to win these in uh, the raffle. So it plugs into a user port. Actually, let me plug this one back. I hit in there. Yeah. Are all these two. items on your website? Yep. They're on the website right now. So we'll power up uh, our handy 964. And uh, let's see if you can see this. It powers up. So it's a nice little display. So you can see uh, it tells you status information about it. Right now, it says it's connected to uh, internet connection. That's called Goog 6 because um, I'm using Greg's hotspot, so <laughs> it's on his phone. So if this demo stops in the middle and it's really pathetic, we can uh, blame Greg's hotspot connections. <laughs> so I've got a 1541U2, so I'm gonna load a Z-Term. You can use any terminal program that you wanna use, like CCGMS or Nova Term or any of the terms back in the day. And so basically we've got a standard Z-Term. It's pretty hard for you guys to see what's going on here, but this does support every single one of the standard haste commands. And there's actually a list you can type AT help. So it gives you all the different commands you can do. So remember back in the day we did ATDT, and then which meant attention dial tone, and then we had attention dial pulse for ADDP if you didn't have uh, tone in your area, which when I grew up in uh, Clama Falls, Oregon, we didn't have tone. We had pulse only. Nor did I in Iowa. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> we had the old d -d 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 yep. rotary phone, so we didn't have it. So um, this is, is exactly like having a regular dial-up modem, but instead of dialing a number, you're dialing a URL. So if you want to dial um, Google, you can actually dial Google if you want to. You're not going to get anything out of it, but you can connect to it. If you dial this great place called Commodore Server, um, which I'm going to cheat because I don't want to type in CommodoreServer.com, I've got a phone book you can actually store all the different URLs in. And so I've got Craig's website set up to dial here, commonserver.com says connect. And if I do directory, Jimmy put it in brackets mode so you can see. This is the uh, directory off of Craig's website. 
on that disk. Uh, remember plus 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 back in the day? ATH, hang up, no carrier. Uh, another website that's kind of cool for to show. Bring back some nice books. We're out of type. Uh, ATPS2. This is no all distance charges. Yeah, this is how long the URL is, by the way. <laughs> so I don't want to type that every time. So my phone book, I entered it once, and you can type AT, the DS, whatever, dial stored, 0123, whatever. So this is kind of cool. This is South of Heaven website. Remember all these? Back in the day, we used to see cool graphics and all this. Wow. Now, Greg said I can only do this one time because it burns up a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> There's another 2K. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, this one, it's a standard modem. Literally, you can log in stuff. I do have um, support in it for changing polarities, which is kind of an interesting subject that Craig knows a lot about, Steve knows a lot about as well, because um, Commodore is backwards for polarity for its lines compared to standard RS-232. So, when they did the 38.4 driver for yours, because it's standard RS-232, it's backwards polarity. So I have the option to switch polarity so you can actually use their 38.4 driver with the Commodore 64. So you can do that baud rate with it, which is pretty cool. It has a UP9600 hack built into it. You're familiar with that at all? You can run 9600 baud on your Commodore 64 with a little hack by having some extra wires that were added in different places. It's got that built into it automatically, so you can run 9600 baud right off the, without doing anything at all, other than having Nova turn with the driver. So, so if that's that. That's a new product that's been out for a couple months now. Um, I sell a lot of them. I'm shocked how many I actually sell because I can't believe people are actually doing it. It's so popular right now. I've had people beg me from the Amiga community to make one for the Amiga. Oh. <laughs> and make it so that it'll actually plug into the parallel port. So we can do it as a slip type of connection, but it actually is a parallel slip. You can actually run Geos with it, with a browser. Actually, Contiki we can use with it. So you can actually do a real web browser. So you can actually surf the internet on your 64, for real. So, People is, have been trying that for a long time. And not very you can do it now. Another thing I found out right before I came here is that remember Q-Link back yes. in the day? Q-Link's back online. Yeah. And so one thing about the Q-Link software is that you have to dial with a phone number. It won't accept the URL. So I'm going to make a, a, a spoof, basically, in the software where you can equate a phone number to a URL. And huh. when the modem sees that phone number, it substitutes the uh, URL for it. So we can actually dial a key link. You can do it right now by actually connecting manually with a terminal program and then go into and say you're dialing it and it sends out crap to the, to the modem. But it connects because it knows that the, the uh, data connection line is connected. And then you can actually be on a key link. With it. So it's kind of a big fad right now. I was really surprised. So. Anyway, so retail price of these is fifty-four ninety-five. I have some here; they're forty bucks here. If you want, let me know. So that's that. Okay. Jim, yes. question: yeah. um, What are the differences between your Y modem and Leaf Bloomquist Y five modem from Canada? Leaf has an actual Arduino developer thing on it, so you can actually put Arduino like parts and like on it and do like a developer board, like you would have like uh, a Shield. It's basically what's based on Shield. Okay. Yeah. That's supposedly that's what it is. It doesn't it. have a shield. No, it's not a shield, but you can put parts on his board yeah. and connect it and write software for it. It's also one hundred and fifty dollars for the low end version instead of fifty four ninety five. And I've got the multicolored OLED, and it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Very pretty. The one you're selling for forty is the yeah. with the case. No, no, no case. The case comes from a guy from Canada called uh, Core i sixty four. He's on Lemon. He makes cases for everything. Oh. So he wanted to make a case for us. Like, sure, no problem. I sent him a couple of them, and he made cases for them. Hmm. It's a pretty simple case. Nice. Um, but you don't really need much of a case, because it's actually pretty well protected for itself. And the display is actually pretty versatile. So you don't have to worry about it getting banged around at all. So oh, one thing, thing I forgot to tell you about, too. Uh, some of the features I got in here are things that I needed, because that's how I always do things for myself. When you're a developer, the last thing you want to do is pull it out of the computer, stick it into a USB interfacing, and flash it, and wait. Even at uh, one megabaud flash rate, which is what it'll handle, it still takes a long time to flash. So every time I make a change to the code, I was having to do that. So I ended that because 
I now on my server, I can upload the latest version to my server, and all you have to do is type in AT update, and it automatically goes to the server, downloads it, and flashes itself. Hmm. Never take it out of the computer ever. So it's automatically. And then if there's a screw up, I've done that before, um, you can type in AT downgrade, and it goes back <laughs> to the original version. <laughs> wow. So it's got both built in. Wow. So that's something I wanted to make sure I had for uh, make it easy for everybody just to update the firmware. So that's my 64 stuff that I've done. Around over here in the corner, we've got Amiga stuff. The power of the Enterprise over here. Ah, the Enterprise. That would be the pivot spot. Yeah, oh, good. Shift your knees over a little. I showed this last year. This is the FPGA arcade replay. And what this is is an actual board. It's an FPGA board with a 24 bit audio DAC and a a DVI connection to it, as well as composite video output. And it lets you use FPGA cores for basically everything that's supported, like real arcade games. It's not like an emulation of the game, it's the actual circuitry of the game put in an FPGA. So you'll see things like Pac-Man, um, there's a slew of different game programs that are actual real arcade stand-up, and they're loaded off an SD card. So all you have to do, basically is select what you want, Go and play Pac-Man. So I can load the Pac-Man game. Oh, one thing too. <laughs> so it supports the actual character display. So you can have games that are flipped this way or, or, up, or you know, flat you know, on the game itself. But like Phoenix and Pac-Man, some of the games, you know, typical arcade stand-up style game. So. But at any given time, you can actually change what you want to play. Let's see. And this has options for like, what Pac-Man is it? You can actually make it Super Pac-Man, all the different variations of Pac-Man, how many coins you're going to put into it. You know, it's free play, exactly like the original arcade machine's got for all its little uh, difficult settings. Let's see, what else is in here? We've got Adventure Vision, back in the day. Asteroids, of course. Atari 800 emulation, BBC emulation, 64 emulation, Legal Vision, Cosmic Avenger, um, Galaga. I Galaga. think Galaga is also a tilted display, too. Yeah. <coughs> Which direction tilt, though? That's the question. <laughs> it's a memory test. Oh, it's the other direction yeah. tilt. No. So I'm not quite sure. <laughs> 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 So that's Galaga. Okay. Um, it, this board is a little tiny board. So what I've got here is a uh, is a ATX case. And so I just mounted it in the ATX case because it has an ATX mounting in the back of it. So there's like the board's this big and the case is like this big. <laughs> but I also make a um, an adapter for standard PC power supplies that when you attach it to it, you've got lines for your hard drive uh, LED as well as your power switch and stuff. So it basically gets a soft on and off. Normally you have to ground one of the wires on a PC power supply for it to turn on and off. It's actually having a board that actually turns it on and off with the power switch and all that. So one of the changes that changed from last year quite a bit is the Amiga emulation. Last year the Amiga emulation was uh, 14 megahertz uh, 020, which is like what a Amiga 1200 is. And now the core is uh, a lot faster than it was. So this is actually, now imagine, this is how I program Amiga in this resolution. I don't have a big, huge screen like we do nowadays. And for my coding right now, because I was used to this back for you know, 15, 20 years I did Amiga stuff, this is how I still code the Amiga. So my picture or my characters are this big on the screen, basically. I have to see everything. This is a 640 by 200 resolution. Whereas on my home PC and my office PC, I run 1920 by 1200. So my fonts are this big. But I got so used to this, I couldn't actually switch. So uh, let's see. Where's which Amiga? So this shows this is a 56.8 megahertz 020. So it's a pretty mm -hmm. decent core. But again, remember, this is strictly um, emulating every single pin in the Amiga. So it's the Gale chip and uh, the audio ch Apollo chip. 
And this supports uh, the SuperCard Pro image files directly. So if you've got an um, image you made, like of your disk or any of these disks, it, it retains the copy protection as well. So when you boot the disk, it plays exactly like the original with the copy protection and everything. Same long loading times and all that. But it still works exactly like the original. So this is the replay. I'm still the US distributor of this. This is really a popular product. Uh, fortunately, Mike is actually taking this a little more serious now. And he's actually making mass production of this. Before we had like limited quantities, I got a whole batch in last week, and they were gone in seven minutes. True. So it's real popular, but um, because it does all the different things, arcade games and all that, so it's a lot more of a general audience than just strictly Amigo or strictly 64, because it does everything. The whole unit with the case and everything? No, they sell just the board, little just tiny board. Yep. Yeah. When, when is the next batch coming out? Do you know? No, I don't know. Um, but I know that he's actually in production, and we have a daughter board for this board as well. Basically, there's a daughter board that goes on top of this, and it's going to be a 68040 slash 060 either way. And it has more RAM, 128 megs more memory, it has um, an Ethernet port, it's got uh, four USB ports, and all this little daughter board plugs right into it. So you can use that CPU instead of using the CPU core as well. So that emulation will be based on that particular CPU if you want to do that way. Okay, so that's you, the replay. Can you copy ADF files to this? Yeah, yeah, it supports ADF, HDF. Basically what I do for doing all my development for Amiga stuff on non-Amiga stuff is I take a compact flash card and I swap them between them, or an SD card, and I just swap the files, or the hard drive files, like .HDF, or even like a compact flash. You can actually support compact flash directly. So you could use a GoTech? Yeah, I, well, actually there's a, uh, a floppy interface that's coming out for it that's on the, one of the headers that I've worked on with the guys, so you can actually plug a real floppy drive into it at that point. In, or, or go tech either way. It's the same and that would interface. load, there's a hard drive in here now or just the uh, compact flash? There's actually just an SD media card in this one right now. That's okay, it. So that's what you would copy your stuff mm -hmm. from, uh, from go yeah. tech to this? Or yeah, you pull up directory opus or whatever and just start dragging things across. Yeah, I mean, just like a hard drive. Uh, exactly just like, like a hard, hard drive. Hard. Yeah, it's done as two different hard drives. This is how uh, Gale works on an A1, uh, A1200 or A4000. Okay, so that's that. So we're now we're looking at this. This isn't a real Amiga 2000, but it has um, a board in it for an accelerator called the Vampire board. And the Vampire 500, which is um, compatible with the A500, the A1000, and the A2000. It also is a little tiny card, which um, I'll grab one out of here in a bit and show you. It's literally tiny. And it plugs into the 68000 slot. So you can pull the 68000 chip out, you plug this in, Actually, you can take your 2.0 ROM or 3.0 ROM out and throw it away as well because you don't need either one of them. And then when you power up, it powers up as a pretty fast Amiga. In fact, it's 111 MIPS. So if you look at like your accelerated machine is 9.87 MIPS with a 68030, this is 111. Yeah, it's fast. And it has RTG built into it, so it supports the Picasso 96 system all built into it. Uh, I'm working with, uh, it's called the Apollo Core, so I'm working with the Apollo team. They contacted me basically because uh, Fusion didn't work, which is my Mac emulation. So I started getting involved with that because of Fusion. And so it turns out now that I um, kind of made a deal with uh, the guy in Canada that makes the boards that I'm going to be the distributor for the U.S. as well for this product. They're not available in mass quantities yet because um, they're still working on production. So. So if you've got a board like a 2091 board, you can leave it in place and add the Vampire board to it and they're compatible? They'll work together. Yeah, they'll work with any Amiga hardware. I can throw implant boards or whatever I want in there. But for the accelerator-wise, um, you can take the accelerator out. You can leave any kind of hard drive cards, like a 2091 card. It still works with it. This has a compact flash interface on it, an IDE port. So it actually boots from that. So I've got it. Actually, it's an IDE hard drive, and I can show you the, the speed-wise on here. Let me sneak over here. Um, we'll do oh, that screen mode. So you got there's a gazillion screen modes you can set. Uh, where is my? Here we go. Speed test. So this is which Amiga? This says it's a 68 LCO 40 at 234.1 megahertz. So that shows you how much faster an FPGA is than original 68060 or 040 or 20 or the standard 68000 that was in here originally. So anybody's familiar with um, AIBB? Unfortunately, I can't go promote this screen. So this is going to be, we'll go back over here. So Robert can see this. So like here's an EMU test. 
So that gives you an idea. This is compared to an A4000 here. And that's how much faster this is. <laughs> yeah. So it's a little bit different in uh, speed wise. Here's a matrix test. Um, even things that uh, use memory access for, like uh, this. Remember that this is a stock 68,000 motherboard, so you're still using chip memory. So you can see it's not as fast as you would expect it to be, but it's still faster than other machines. Not quite as fast as an uh, 4000. Remember the 4000 has uh, double wide chip memory, so it's a lot faster for chip memory. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, IMAP. Pretty much everything you're going to see is, is like this. And then get out of here so we can look at sysinfo. So sysinfo speed. Oh. Is that. So this is 111 MIPS. And this is a, a 4000 right here. So this gives you an idea to clear off the chart at this point. Is that shrink or expand? What's that? Can you shrink it? And I'll see the you can't even see it. Yeah, you can. Wow. That's what I'm saying. It's beyond the limits. It's beyond the limits of Sysinfo for showing it. <laughs> yeah, so the performance really is that much faster. But again, this is strictly a board that plugs into the original 68000 slot and it's strictly an accelerator for the CPU. It takes all the other functions of the computer, but it also adds HDMI output. So your video output on the RTG is done through HDMI directly. And when they designed the hardware, they did it pretty slick because they, they have a part of the core that where you can point an Amiga screen, it automatically does the bit plane conversion, outputs it to the HDMI as part of their H the, uh, FPGA block. So there's no CPU time stolen out of it to so do this it. This is all right. the, uh, the uh, Vampire card? Yep, it's all and the Vampire card. shows in the back as a back plate and plug the HDMI in right there? No, actually there's a connection inside of it. You, you run it out. You can actually run it to a back plate if you want to do a converter plug to a back plate. I just have mine to get on the back side of the computer. I open up one of the holes where the board slide in, right. ran the cable out, plugged it in. So, does anybody remember Fusion back in the day that I wrote? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Fusion. So, let's see. Let's do video. Pull that up. Picasso screen. There was very few things I had to change in Fusion to make it work with this. <laughs> so we use a Macintosh, they don't boot that fast normally anyway. <laughs> so so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that it, how fast this really is. And it supports basically every game and, and stuff. And we ran this one I ran earlier. So. All the video production stuff you can? Yeah. Yeah, you can run Avis video system. You can do whatever you want. Any kind of Mac program you can run on it, it, it runs on Fusion. So one of the things about uh, Macs that a lot of people don't understand, unless you're a Mac guy, is um, Apple uses um, the FPU for just about everything once available. In fact, to calculate the window positions, they actually use the FPU to calculate an actual coordinate, which is kind of ridiculous, but they do. Right now, um, Gunner, who is the responsible for the core, another guy named Chris, they're working on the FPU part of this. So there'll be an FPU in it, because right now it's a 68LC040, which means there's no FPU. When the FPU core is added, this will be insane, because the rendering at that point will be nuts, how much faster it is than a real Mac. So right now, on benchmarking, this is actually faster than a PowerPC Mac, the early ones. So when we get the FPU in there, it'll be like leaps and bounds faster. So. So I've never played this game before, but apparently it works just fine. A lot of guys in the Apollo team play it you know, for testing, testing, quote unquote. So, so this board's supposed to retail, so theoretically, somewhere between 199 and 229 for the board. And it has flasher updates, so you could actually update the firmware right from the Amiga. Basically, you run the Amiga program and it flashes itself and then updates the firmware. Not, this is not yeah. full production yet? Not full production. I have, uh, in fact, the, the 600 is actually out officially. The V500, which is for the 500, the 1000, and the 2000, is not out at all. I have a couple of the prototypes boards, and they work great. So they're getting ready to do full production on it. So we expect uh, pretty soon 
we should be able to have them. But um, literally, the interest in this has skyrocketed. It's, yeah, there's like thousands. Do you order a compact price? Well, no, I don't, because I don't know <laughs> the price for sure, what it will actually be between 199 and, and 229 There's kind of a little bit of a war going on right now with that, so I don't have control of that. It's not my product, but I wanted to be a distributor for the U.S., and they're like, yes, that we don't have to deal with them. <laughs> so, so that's that. Uh, I can answer questions later about it. Last little toy over here I want to show is uh, my SX-64. If you come on over here, I can show you this. <laughs> I'm trying to go fast because Robert said we got cake afterwards. <laughs> okay, I have for sale. <laughs> Anybody know what this is? <laughs> this is this is Dick's TV. <laughs> no, this is actually the monitor out of an SX64. In fact, it's the monitor out of this one because I got rid of all this apparatus, which weighs a little over five pounds, and I put in a TFT. So you notice that uh, there's some extra space in here. That's, this is where the TFT goes, it's right here. And then uh, we didn't have any more audio because the speaker is connected to here. And so um, I made a speaker enclosure box, which I need to actually attach with brackets, for a real speaker with a real amplifier. So when you power this up, it, uh, it's beautiful, actually. It's a really nice, clean display. You can see it from all different angles. So it's super nice. And I left my disc over there. <coughs> my demo disc. For whatever reason, this was my favorite game when I was playing 64 stuff. <coughs> so, one thing about this is that there's a board that was designed to actually interface this here because you notice that we had this control panel I ripped out here, right? So, this board has all the different controls on it here and they're functional for the monitor. So I can actually adjust the tint, the brightness, and all this right from here. So we should probably get out of here so we can see this there. So the audio here, it's pretty funny yesterday we were listening to this because I had actually tested it um, very well. insert for here and the box is tuned to 60 hertz so which is good for bass but <laughs> it's much better and when you put this on here of course it's a little more you know, bass and, and tone so you have the ability to change modes that's composite video mode and then this is SVHS mode which I don't think looks as good as the composite because there's some bleeding on the edges but it is crisper for the characters it's a chroma split which game is this this is Transformers, Transformers. Yeah. So I took out five pounds of weight basically out of the SX and uh, made it better looking and stuff. Um, I might have a kit for doing this, this little box you make. And the amplifier itself is a $3 jobby off of uh, eBay from China. It's a 10 watt amplifier. But it's pretty simple to wire in. Um, basically, when you pull this out, you get a 12 volt line that runs through the computer and we need 12 volts for the display and for the amplifier itself so I just tied them both into it so it made it really easy. If you've got uh, a system like John's, where's John at? It's not here, is he? Oh. Okay, so John's got an SX64 that's uh, possessed by the devil. Uh. <laughs> because um, when you plug John's monitor power in, the drive doesn't work. And so we spent uh, one full convex about three years ago trying to figure out what it was. And I said, basically, you need to go to a priest and have an exorcism done. <laughs> we can't figure out what it was. <laughs> so uh, John really wants to do that for that computer. So that way he can actually have a disk drive that works with a monitor. Because right now for his games, he's got basically type in, load, and then pull the monitor plug, and then let it run, let it load, and then plug the monitor in <laughs> for it to work. So. So anyways, this little trick that I did, uh, this board over here that was built for all these controls also has my ultra reset built into it. 
So you can actually change the drive number and you can also change ROMs with just the reset button on the front. So like this is a drive reset normally, but if you hold it for two seconds, it'll actually reset the computer. And if you hold it for five seconds, it'll swap the drive numbers for you. That's a thing I've been selling for a long time that we put in a lot of them years and years ago, what, five years ago we did that in those. So it's built into the board. This is a project that was developed by the guys in Germany on a forum called forum64.de. If you take a look at that, you can see all the information about it. What happened, how I got involved in the project is that they said, hey, can you sell us some of your picks from your Ultra Reset? And I'm like, why? They said, get me a link. Well, they actually copied my entire circuit out of my Ultra Reset and put it on the board. And they said, we'd like to buy some of your picks now. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. You know, Kind of an open source type of thing, except I didn't open source the, the firmware for it. But I'm, I'm selling the, the, the pick itself separately. Do you so. have any plans for that open space? What, this here? Yeah. No, uh, in the front. The shelf. the shelf. Oh, here. Yeah, well, yeah, I've actually, I'm going to probably put a 1581 drive in it. Okay. Because a 1541, uh, another one in here, like the DX, basically what happens when you do that, the drive, it's hard for you to see. Let me uh, kill the power to this. If I can break in it. Okay. Stay. That's okay. All right, so the 1541 drive, if you can see, it actually goes back to about right about here. So if you put one on the top side, you have to relocate the cartridge port. And to do that, it's a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do is put a 1581 in here because the 1581 is actually shorter than this is. Right. And then the circuit board for the 1581 can be over here in this big open space. That would have a 1581 in it. And then the other thing I want to put in here too is I've got a small module. It's actually a Bluetooth audio module. And I'm going to wire it in, hook it up to the speaker. That way I can play Bluetooth uh, music <laughs> right into my N64. Okay. Off my phone. So. Any questions about this at all? Or anything else? Come see me. That's it. Let's have some cake. Let me uh, make a couple quick announcements before we eat cake. But the person who donated these standing here right now, we don't know, we want to know what they are so we can tell people. <laughs> I but believe I, I believe it's uh, Switchless Jiffy DOS, well, we but I'm not sure. Oh, that's from um, Polder Dash. Can that's yeah. I brought those. Okay, so yeah. So those are uh, that's what Switchless, switchless Jiffy DOS. Right. Yeah. Okay, this got it. Uh, that one's like video RAM for the 128. Right, okay. and the other one is Switchless Jiffy DOS. Basically, you can clip leads on different places, and you can use the keyboard to change which ROM you're booting from. Okay. And I don't remember know, Ken's last name, but remember we have these nice T-shirts that Tim Waite made up. For, uh, he's selling them for twenty-five dollars. We should all be wearing one tomorrow. Uh, I don't think he has enough for everybody, so get in line quickly. Uh, Tell them about the Amiga serial numbers. Yeah, this book was written by our newsletter editor Leonard Roach from Kansas City. He's been here a couple of times. I don't have the details. I think I have them somewhere in my iPad. Uh, we're not selling them here, but he's taking pre-orders. Uh, kind of like Commodore back in the day, give us money today and we will send you a product someday. <laughs> <laughs> so this book was sold here a few years ago, and I think it's, it's a slight update. It's the 10th anniversary issue. Let's eat cake. All right. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.